On the show today, we'll discuss infrastructure development in Africa and how best to design the future cities on the continent. As always, you can join the conversation with the hashtag Beyond Markets, and you can follow my Twitter handle too at Esther O. Awone. Now, what trends will underline how we design and build the future infrastructure and cities across the African continent? We're joining me from Johannesburg to discuss this. Uh, Jabulili and Klapo, Building Services Associate at WSP in Africa, and Marinda Bjostad, an Associate Director at Bugatman and Partners Architects. Now, Jabu, let me start with you. Uh, we're seeing a lot of collaboration happening across uh, the continent as it were when it comes to designing building spaces. For instance, an engineer uh, working in a silo needs to learn more or learn and understand what is important to the other disciplines as well. Help us understand how this is changing the way uh, everyone involved in designing or building uh, a space, how it works right now. So traditionally as engineers, you know, you would sit, you would work in silos, do your design and then give it to the other discipline and it would also almost work as a chain. So you do your design, pass it on to the next discipline and they give you comments back. But what we're finding now is from the moment that you start conceptualizing what you want to do as an engineer, you need to start involving other disciplines, um, not just other, other professionals in the built environment, but also understanding your stakeholders. That might be your users, your client, what's their vision, what's their strategy. And all of that information is important before you even start beginning with the design process. Marina, what is your perspective? Absolutely. Coming from an architectural perspective, it's key for us to work closely with not only fellow consultants on the professional team, but also collaborators often across borders to um, join our thinking and each input um, valuable information so that we can uh, develop our ideas and our designs around the input from others so that we don't, as Jabalile says, um, work in silos, but rather um, work collaboratively to get better solutions, um, more robust solutions um, for, for the context in which we work. Okay, now Jab, we're talking about building smart cities for Africa in the future. Now, these are co the conversations, uh, the ongoing conversation around how this is going to work. And when we hear, uh, for instance, I mean, just looking at the definition of a smart city, something that's going to involve a lot of um, resilience, of course, sustainability and technology also. But what we're also hearing is that how it's going to play out in developing countries here on the continent could be significantly different from how it will take shape in developed Western economies. So what, what are your thoughts or perspective on how we are taking that into account here in Africa, especially in developing cities? So one of the benefits about living in Africa is that we don't have a lot of infrastructure. So some people might see that as a bad thing, but what it can do is it actually allows us to leapfrog over what other developed countries might have uh, legacy systems that restrict them from implementing technology. So there really is a lot of opportunity within Africa to pull some of the technologies that we're seeing internationally and apply them to our local context. Um, we've seen examples like in, in Rwanda where they're using drones to deliver um, blood samples to hospitals. You know, a lot of developed countries aren't even using drones in, in their major um, uh, uh, businesses as yet, but locally we're doing that. So there's a lot of opportunity for us to do great things. And um, I see Africa as, you know, uh, it's a, it's, we have a wealth of opportunity locally. Now, Marinda, for some other experts, they believe that, uh, I mean, obviously, Jabo made a very good, some very good points there. But they also say that for Africa, we may need to go back to the drawing table. And by that, I mean, we, there might have to be a, a complete review of infrastructure uh, plans or projects right now, a total review suggesting that there might be some, uh, there might need to be some readjustment. And I'm thinking, uh, wouldn't that be a, a, a serious, a big, big challenge for African countries? Absolutely. Um, with the growing, uh, the rapid growth of urbanization, uh, infrastructure is one of the, the many aspects of a city that are going to be challenged. Um, and we're going to be tasked with thinking more creatively um, in order to meet these challenges. Um, at the end of the day, uh, I believe good design um, is key to ensuring that the buildings we design are sustainable and uh, improve the context in which they, they, they sit, as opposed to burdening them with 
uh, unnecessary um, infrastructural requirements. So designing sustainably, I think, is, is key to the success of uh, working in such contexts. Now, Marina, what we also hear is that uh, when building these smart cities for Africa, obviously, like I mentioned earlier, sustainability, resilience, th those are two key factors. Also, another aspect will be building, uh, taking people into account, how they live, how they work, all those factors should also be taken into account when building those cities. What, are your, what is your perspective? Absolutely. Um, despite globalization, I think it's a very important to always think locally and respond um, in a human-centered nature um, uh, with keeping that key in our design process to designing. We are designing building for people and uh, they have specific um, cultural um, aspirations. They, they have specific building requirements and um, designing for the people and making our buildings um, culturally sustainable is, is, is as important as making them environmentally or economically sustainable. Great. Now, Jabo, uh, Marindu just mentioned uh, cultural aspirations. Now, for you, how do we leverage on the diversity on our continent to produce the best solutions for clients and, of course, projects? So, when you look at the local context, um, culturally, you know, Africans, when we live in our environments, we like space. We like to see greenery, um, whereas in uh, the developed countries, there's very high rise buildings. People live in um, big metropolises. So how do we design such that the people um, locally want to live in the buildings that we are designing? They want to live in the cities that we're um, building. And, and um, how do we make sure that the, the systems that we're building for them, the transport infrastructure actually adds to their quality of life? So, for example, I mean, if I design better, more sustainably in terms of transport, it could make the whole transportation, public transportation system, more cost effective. If it's more cost effective to the users, it drives economic development because people can spend money on things like education and things that add value to our lives. Now, Jabo, still with you. Yes, we're going to build cities, smaller cities for the future, but the cities that we have now, many of them are... Uh, crowded, not integrated, and many of them are also expensive to live in. I'm just wondering, uh, as we go into developing smart cities for the, for the future, the cities that we have now, there is still a big challenge. How are we, or how are developers, architects, engineers, how are you all working together to see how you can overcome the challenge of how our cities are shaped now, going into how we're going to shape them for the future? There always is, as, a, as an engineer, as a designer, you know, it's very easy to build a building, design a building from scratch, a greenfield building, but to take an existing building and transform it into something that's applicable today is always a lot more challenging, but that's the importance of collaboration. Um, you know, when you start sharing ideas with other disciplines, with architects, with, you know, sometimes even people outside of the built environment, you, you can really produce solutions that um, are innovative and that really can address some of the social challenges and the, the infrastructure challenges that we're facing here. Marinda, when you think about the AU's agenda uh, 2063, uh, envisioning uh, a united and prosperous Africa, obviously that, inv that would involve uh, billions of dollars in investments in, in infrastructure. And as you mentioned earlier, there's the opportunity to leapfrog. But at the heart of all of this is investments in infrastructure. And of course, there's a plan also in place to ensure that the cities that we build going forward are sustainable, are resilient, taking into account environmental impact and how we as humans uh, live and work in those cities. When you think about the plan, looking over it, what, do you, what, what speaks to you, what jumps out at you in that plan? And in terms of ach achieving the overall objective of it, especially around infrastructure, what comes to mind for you? Um, Esther, that's a good question um, and the kind of the specificities I can't talk to you sp um, exactly but for me um, as a designer um, I always put design um, at the heart of, of everything and I think good design, good planning as we've said previously in this discussion um, is key to to creating uh, a sustainable future um, and also ensuring that there's a transfer of knowledge um, between um, consultants, between people, between stakeholders, between clients, um, that uh, we're sharing knowledge openly um, so that we can all learn and grow um, and improve the environments in which we work. Uh, that's a good point you made there, transfer of knowledge between consultants in countries across the continent. Obviously, that is key, uh, looking at how one design works in this country and how it can be applied 
to uh, another country. To what extent is that helping to achieve uh, more sustainable plans or more sustainable cities? So I think each of us, um, we work in a very specific built environment with building practices, um, with um, professional systems that we are comfortable with. And I think the moment that you are taken out of your comfort zone, so to speak, and challenged to look at problems differently um, and to see it from a different point of view, I think uh, the end result is a far more uh, rich and uh, creative solution. Um, and uh, that's where the magic happens for me. Okay, Jabu, a little diversion now. How would you say the industry is overcoming generational and gender differences? So my understanding is that there's something that every single generation can really bring to the table. Um, you know, uh, all the generations bring their experience and they can really teach us in terms of us not making the same mistakes that they made. Um, however, a lot of people from, uh, lo a lot of professionals who are much older are starting to be mo more open-minded um, to the new technologies that are available. And their engagement with young, with young professionals is becoming so valuable because, you know, they're throwing out around ideas. We're bringing in a, a much newer, um, fresher flavor to, to how we design, uh, fresher thinking, um, bringing data, technology. It's, it's really becoming, um, we're producing better results. And I think it's important for us to, as young people, respect uh, people who have been through the ranks have um, built and designed and really understood a lot about buildings, respect that, but also be open to um, present our solutions to them. All right, ladies, we'll take a short break. We'll thank you for your time so far. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back to pick up from where we left off. I've been speaking to you, Jabolili and Klapo, Building Services Associate at WSP in Africa, and Marinda Bjostad, an Associate Director at Bugatman and Partners Architects. So, guess if you're just joining us, we're focusing on the future of African smart cities. Still with me is Jabolili in Klapo, Building Services Associate at WSP in Africa and Marinda Bjornstad, an Associate Director at Boogerman and Partners Architects. Thank you, ladies, for your time so far. Jabu, let me start with you this time. Sustainability is emerging as a leading approach to design. Help us, uh, give us more insight into how we are approaching and uh, using sustainability uh, to build smart cities and smart spaces. So sustainability is really around thinking about what is it that we need now for the users and how do we design such that the users of the future will still be able to use our buildings and will still be comfortable in our buildings. So there's a lot of thought that goes into it and it requires us as designers and engineers to be really more purposeful in how we do our work, um, think for the long term and not just for today. So it's really adding a lot to the, to the local us building um, sus uh, sustainable buildings and smart cities. Every single professional's contribution is very valuable and every single professional has to be really be purposeful and thoughtful about how they do things. Well, are there things you take, take into consideration, things like climate change or adverse weather conditions? Are those also important factors? Those are, are very important factors. So climate change as well as, I mean, locally, the energy that we're using in buildings, how do we design systems that utilize less energy? How do we use less electrical energy? Um, how do we even design our buildings? More specifically in my field as an HVAC engineer, if you're not just looking at installing a system or designing a system, but contributing or collaborating with the architect to um, build a better building as well. Um, more insulation might help us to lose less heat to the environment, um, more overhangs, other building elements are important to me as a mechanical engineer, not just my systems. Marinda, I'd like to hear your perspective on that, especially around, I mean, changing weather uh, as a trigger. I knew that, I mean, that, that is a major factor, and I knew that architects also take that into consideration. Share your perspective with us. Absolutely. I think uh, we need to be very aware of, of, of the climatic um, conditions in which we're designing and also to not worsen the impact uh, on for future generations. Simple things like orientating your buildings well, um, designing buildings that are designed for the climate they're in, um, that have appropriate um, glazing or glazing where it's appropriate and overhangs where necessary. It all reduces the, the requirements on a service such as uh, air conditioning um, if we design our buildings well, then the demands we make on the infrastructure are far less. Mm -hmm. um, so again, uh, good design is so important um, in uh, making our buildings more sustainable. 
Now, obviously, if Africa is going to get it right, if we're going to leapfrog, I mean, luckily for us, there, there's that opportunity to leapfrog some of the challenges uh, that uh, uh, we've known traditionally using technology especially. We're also going to need to focus or, or follow international best practices. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think we um, in South Africa, we, we design to the, the Green Building Council or we're members of the Green Building Council. And um, for us, uh, designing sustainably is, is, is almost, it's a standard. It's no longer a, a something that we add later or it's a luxury. Um, and I think we just uh, as, as an architectural community in South Africa would like to see our buildings become more and more, and more sustainable. Jabalila, I'd like to hear your perspective on that too. I know that at WSP you have access to about 43,000 professionals worldwide. Tell us about that. So we're, we're a multinational firm, but first and foremost, before anything else, locally we're an African firm. Um, we have African engineers who understand our environments, um, who design for our cities. The great thing about being a multinational is that you can really leverage on some of the technologies and the learnings that your, your colleagues um, have already experienced or designed for or, or built. Take those, um, that, those special insights and really apply them to our local context. See where we can you know, tweak them so that they make sense for us as a people in Africa. But there's one thing we've not talked about, and that is cost. Uh, Jabu, maybe you could uh, just uh, share your thoughts on that. I mean, these, these smart cities we're going to have in the future, with, there's talk about them being obviously smarter, there's talk about, talk about uh, technology playing a big part, and if there's going to be sustainability too, it means that they're being built in a way different than what we have today. But that is going to come at a cost. What can you tell us about that? So that can be a misconception at times to say that building sustainably, um, building smart cities would actually incur a lot of costs on, on investors. But that's really not the case. Um, when you're an engineer or when you're a designer built a professional environment, the big drive is on how can we deliver innovative solutions that don't break the banks for our clients? Um, how can we really thoughtfully cost effectively make sure that we're, we're pr producing comfortable environments. So really, the, I think it really is a uh, misconception. And there's a lot of value add in taking our technologies further within the African continent. And a lot that we can gain, not just um, from the built environment perspective, but just from a socioeconomic perspective as well. Marinda, would you like to sh uh, pitch in, share your perspective on that issue around cost? Yeah, absolutely. I think part of sustainable thinking is working smartly with the resources you have and uh, economic resources is one of those um, and we should be looking at using the technology in such a way that um, we use it smartly, that it, it informs the way our buildings work, informs the way that people use um, our buildings so that we can almost achieve more with less. Um, so, yes, absolutely. Um, although, as Jabba says, there is a misconception that um, sustainable buildings are, are more expensive. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be so. Now, I've seen some, uh, Marinda, still with you, um, I've seen some documentaries on uh, you know, prototype buildings that we would see uh, in the future, perhaps not in Africa. The, the documentary I saw was actually one in a, developed, uh, in, in, the, in a developed economy, and it looked quite futuristic. And I, and I remember watching the client talking to the architect and the demands were very, you know, were quite specific. And of course, sustainability and having a building that's friendly to the environment were key for that particular client. Now, when you're speaking to your client, what do you see uh, coming through these days in terms of their needs, uh, how they want the buildings to interact with the environment going, going forward? Yeah, absolutely. A, a sustainable agenda is very important uh, for many of our clients. Um, and there's a de definitely a global awareness that uh, our planet is limited in its resources and we need to use them wisely. Um, and it's our task and also our privilege often to walk a journey with a client. Often the technologies involved with sustainable buildings um, are new to us, uh, sometimes experimental, and often it is a journey we need to take with our clients in exploring um, unknown uh, technologies. Um, but uh, yes, I think when we look at the, the buildings of the future, buildings that breathe, buildings that uh, interact in a, in a completely different way with the people that use them, it's, uh, it's, it's very exciting and, and our imagination can only, uh, it has no limits to what the possible buildings of the future could look like. And 
Yeah, very excited. Uh, absolutely. I'm actually quite uh, looking, for, looking forward to that. If I'm around, <laughs> obviously won't be around in the year 2063. Now, Jabulile, back to you again. I'm just wondering, are we moving fast enough in Africa? I mean, there's so many conversations around how we want to build smart cities. And of course, a lot of investment has to go into it. From your experience so far, would you say that we're putting in the right uh, uh, energy into it, the right amount of energy, the right amount of resources? And are we moving at a pace that is also sustainable? So, you know, there are a lot of professionals who are driving sustainability, smart cities, and are starting to be more thoughtful and purposeful in how we do things. However, this is a, it's a combined effort, not just uh, on the built professional side, but in terms of property developers, governments, you know, everyone has a part to play in making sure that we deliver sustainable cities, smart cities for our environments. So yes, I would say that we, we are you know, lagging in the speed, but there has been a lot of progress over the past couple of years. Um, more specifically in our urban environments, we've seen that clients are, are driving sustainable practices, they're wanting to use less energy. You know, if you sit in a meeting with a client these days, they're, they're thinking a lot differently than the client of maybe 10 years ago. They're wanting to put in solar panels, they're wanting to find out how better or how, how better can I run my building without consuming a lot of energy? How can I make my building more comfortable for my, for my people? So there is, there is a drive towards it, uh, but there is some, okay. yes. Okay, sorry to butt in. I asked you that question because, you know, we, when we look at the, the rapid urbanization that's happening in Africa and looking at the numbers, the, the rate at which urban, uh, people are moving into urban centers and the, the amount of investments going into infrastructure to cater uh, for, those, for those, uh, those large numbers, I'm just wondering and a little concerned that we'll be able to stay ahead of the curve. That's both the private sector and the government to stay ahead of the urban, uh, the rapid urbanization that we're seeing? There is, there is a lot of work to do, and that is the reality within our African con context. Um, governments, as well as professionals, have to have an understanding of that. But really, if we can come together and um, fast track that process, um, if investors can really start paying more attention to what they need to be doing for our, for our uh, cities, then we can, we can overcome it. Marina, would you like to share your perspective on that? The, urban, the rapid urbanization that we're seeing and us as a, as a continent being able to stay ahead to ensure that as we're building or we're thinking about building those cities, we're also taking into consideration the numbers of people who are moving into those urban centers and taking into account how we're going to cater to those numbers. Yeah, absolutely, because I think with that rapid urbanization, if we're not catering for those people, then there is this risk, and I mean, it, it already happens of, of, of a slum type environment, which is um, not what we envisaged for the people <laughs> in our cities. Um, so yes, we must absolutely, there's, as Jabu said, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, but also when, when we're putting demands on infrastructure and it's struggling to keep up, often that challenges us to think of different technologies. So as opposed to um, looking to main, mainstream power, um, is now looking for alternative technologies, solar, wind. Um, it's, it's great because it actually challenges us to think differently, to be more uh, self-sustainable and um, I think we'll, we'll start producing possibly buildings with a lower carbon footprint and, and uh, off the grid type of buildings. So I think that it actually affords us a good uh, opportunity and an exciting task. Well, thank you so much uh, for your time today. I've been speaking to Jabulele Nklapo, Building Services Associate at WSB in Africa and Marinda Bjornstad, an Associate Director at Bugetman and Partners Architect.